is the second part of the of the notes on common filters. So the idea of common filters is to, given a few ways that I know where um, where an object is, for example, in position, or given a few ways that I have to measure my environment, can I average those uh, probability distributions of each measurement and come up with more or less where I think the actual object uh, is located or a state of the object. So in terms of status, you know, one object might measure the state with a certain probability distribution via one sensor, and then the other sensor might give me the blue probability distribution. Well, can, come up, can I come up with another probability distribution that is somewhat in between that is more accurate as to what is the state of the object that I'm that I'm trying to um, determine. So that's the idea behind common filters. I advise you look at the previous video that gives a little example that ends with the slide. Now, the idea about common filters is that it's an iterative process. So you first predict, you know, where you're going to be, then you measure using your sensors and your computations, and you correct. Uh, where you thought you were going to be. And then, again, you predict where you're going to be next, you move, you measure where you are, you correct, and so on and so forth. So I'm using the example of a moving robot all the time, uh, all the time, because I'm just, that's the example I'm using. But it could be any object with several ways of, of knowing what its state is, right, reporting its state. All right. So let's look at how the common filter is built. Let's say the state of the filter is xt here, right? Let's assume that xt updates with a linear equation. A linear equation is of the form of uh, x of something equals constant times some variable plus constant times constant times some another variable and so on and so forth. Okay, no x squared, if you will, or no anything but x. No variables other than just simple variables, not squared, not with any function. Now, based on, let's say that there's some update equations, AT, which is how I think the state behaves, okay? I also, the robot moves and the robot does things, right? So there might be some effects, or some equations as to how the robot is moving, right? Whether it's accelerating forward or whether it's extending an arm or something. Right? I also will assume that with every prediction, I have a little bit of a, an error associated with it, and my error is going to have a variance RT. But let's say that there's some error, because I don't know. I might predict with the equations of physics and the speed at which I'm moving, which would be AT and BT, right? and the acceleration that I'm applying, I can predict that I'm going to be at a certain point in my route. However, due to things that I cannot control, there might be some error in my prediction. Now, so just to recap, the variables are the state at t minus 1, for example, will be denoted as x t minus 1. The current actions at time t will be u of t. So then, how do I update my state at time t? It'll be, well, the update equations plus the previous state. So I take the previous state, I apply the new equations, and then I also take what is the action that I just performed, and I apply the action equations, and I give the error. This is basically saying that my state here, denoted as x, depends on my previous state. So here, my previous state, x minus 1, right? And some action that I am performing at time t. This is all at time t. These are awful shapes, but you get the idea. And then this will determine again the following state and so on and so forth. This is a hidden Markov model um, <clears throat> problem. So again, we have the update equation for the state will be whatever, however the state updates, multiplied by the previous state, plus whatever the robot did 
multiply by the equations that influence that, plus some error, okay? Now, if these are matrices now, because I have uh, multivariate, many sensors, many, many things going on, right? These will be the dimensions of those matrices. It's left as an exercise to you to figure out why those would be uh, why those would be the dimensions if the state is an n by one matrix and the actions are an m by one matrix. Okay, let's keep going. So usually I know or I can compute the previous state and my actions. And usually I know how the robot behaves so I can update its state based on some equations with the state and some equations for the actions. I will assume, this is my assumption, epsilon to be a Gaussian with mean of zero and a covariance of RT. Okay, this AT, BT, RT, X, mu, these are all gonna be important. Now, this is a proxy way of computing the probability of the state given the actions at that time and the previous state, which is the picture that I just, uh, the picture that I just drew right here, right, this diagram here. All right, now, for example, if my state is comprised of distance and velocity, that'll be my xt, right, and at will contain motion equations. We'll see how, why these are the motion equations, but it's a one, delta t, zero and one, where delta t is like some time, you know, one second or whatever. So let's say this is x. My state is going to com be comprised of distance and velocity. So I want to know, in this, in this case, I want to know how far I am from my target and at what speed I'm going, okay? If that's the case, and then here's another, here's a little bit more. So again, this is my update equation. Now, let's say that the actions that I can take are apply the brakes or accelerate with some force FT related to the mass of the vehicle, M. That's an acceleration, right? That would be some force divided by the mass of the vehicle. Now, if you look at physics from high school, we know that the next distance is going to be the initial distance plus the initial velocity times the time that happens between one, uh, one distance and the other plus one-half times the acceleration times the time square. This is an equation that's in our books of physics, okay, from high school. Now, another equation that's there is that the new velocity is usually the initial velocity plus acceleration times time, right? That's the new velocity if I'm accelerating. Now, let's say instead of i and nothing, we're going to use sub-indices with t, okay? So the equations become dt, the distance at time t, is the previous distance plus the velocity at time, uh, plus the previous velo velocity times some, some time constant, okay, and then plus one half, this is the half right there, of the acceleration, which is force divided by mass, okay, plus some uh, time measurement squared. Right? And we know that the velocity, the actual velocity, this is the distance, and the velocity is going to be the previous velocity plus the acceleration times the delta. I'm looking at distance and velocity, which is the exact same variables that we want our state to have, distance and velocity. Okay? Oops. Now, one can put this in matrix form. So if if x of t minus 1, or x of t, right, is distance and velocity, right, and x t minus 1 is distance and velocity at time t minus 1, right, and a t is this matrix, and u t is the force, is the action, the acceleration that I'm applying, and b t is this matrix, if I put it all together and I multiply this, um, this matrix is, you should get these two motion equations. This one, you should get a matrix with this equation and this equation. Okay, so this equation and this equation in the matrix. 
now. So we have we have the updates on XT. Now let's look at this is where I think I will be based on my physics books from high school. However, I have a sensor. So and it's a hidden markup model, so I have a sensor that I can read my new state. Okay? So we also need to compute the probability of the sensor saying something at time t given the state at time t. Okay? Now in vectors, this is this. The sensor at time t will be some matrix times the state. What this is doing, okay, this, this ct is a k by n matrix and models how the sensor readings affect the state. Okay, so for example, if the sensor is reading time in seconds because it's the time that it takes, you know, the beacon to go back and forth, right? Well, I need to convert those, those seconds into distance. That's what this matrix will do. I will apply the sensors to the state and then plus or minus some error with mean zero and covariance Q of Q sub t. Okay, so again, it's the same Whatever the sensor measures, in this case, a light sensor will measure speed. It won't measure distance directly. It'll measure speed, right? I need to convert the speed to distance, right? And it won't measure velocity, so there's nothing to convert there. Plus, give or take some error. So for measurement, the sensor equations is, is this. Let's say that we have an infrared uh, sensor, right, that measures the distance in seconds. To convert it to meters, if you measure in seconds, right, well, the seconds is the meters divided by the speed of light, right, in an infrared sensor. So now to convert this, the, to convert the, um, my state into uh, meters, right, I need to divide whatever my, my distance is divided by the speed of light, right, that's how many seconds. And then here's a zero for um, for accelerate for uh, velocity because this sensor only measures distance it doesn't measure anything else right remember this is a ct that's going to be multiplied by a state matrix and the state looks like this looks like distance and velocity remember that's what that's what our state looks like so if i compute this i'm going to get a matrix that is distance over the speed of light which is what the sensor measures seconds and then in velocity, I'm going to have zero because the sensor does not measure velocity. Okay, only measure speed. If the sensor were to measure velocity, this zero ch should change to something else. But this is the matrix, CT. Now, the task is to obtain the probability distribution of my belief state at time t, whatever that time t. So I need my belief of whatever state at time t. It's a multivariate Gaussian, so I need to, the parameters for a multivariate Gaussian distribution are the mean and the covariance. Okay, these are matrices. <clears throat> so, first I'm going to compute the belief without the sensors. Okay, and that's going to be here. I, you know, my average state at this point will be my equations of motion plus the acceleration or whatever force we're applying. And then I'm going to compute my covariance, which is how much error was introduced here by, by moving. Okay, so the first equation projects the state ahead. And the second equation projects the error covariance ahead. It predicts how much noise uh, there is. Now, if you don't know the initial R, well, the manufacturer might give you an initial R. Now, Another thing that we need to check is how much do we trust the sensors? And that is called the Kalman gain. And it's basically this equation where we're going to focus on two parts, this part and this part. If we think of this as numbers, right? This is, this is the covariance, the error, and the sensor transformations, right? So, and this QT is the covariance of the sensor. And this is the covariance of my measurements. So I look at my measurements computed by whatever got from the sensor, and then here's some other equation with the covariance of my measurements and the covariance of the sensor together. If I think of this negative one as the inverse, which it is, right? But if I think of it as a number, 
and I think the real estate, K being this. Let's think about it, right? What happens if I have a sensor with no error? So this thing is zero, right? This is, you know, some value. Now, what happens if this value gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger? So my sensor is really, really, really bad. Well, K becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. So K is basically how much am I going to trust my sensor? Okay? How much am I going to trust the sensor? And the more error the sensor gets, the least, the, the less I'm going to trust my sensor. So this is the coefficient. Now, where do we plug it into the sensor equation to either trust or not the sensor? Well, that would be the final belief now with the sensor. So we update our estimation of a state with the previous state plus my common constant and my sensor uh, input. And then I compute the new covariance with the common constant and the sensor measures and the previous covariance. I'm going to take out all the red so you can see the equations. So the equation 4 updates the estimates with the measurements and the feedback. And equation 5 updates the error of covariance. And this is one iteration where I finally got a mu of t and a sigma of t that I can reuse. And then the function the common filter looks like this. You have your initial state, your initial covariance, your current action and your current sensor, and you go through all the equations. Estimate, estimate your, your new state based on physics or you know whatever the equations that are the theory of how things should move. And this is the action, and this is the previous state. We call this x, or mu of t minus 1 is 1 then I will update my covariance because I moved and there's some error introduced by moving. Now I'm going to see how, which, how, to, how much to trust my sensors. And then I'm going to update my state given how much I trust my sensors, right, with the sensor input. And finally, I compute the new error after I've included the sensor. And I will return mu of t and sigma of t that can again come in. Remember, mu of t is giving me a distance, right, and a speed, a velocity, a velocity. So at any given point in time, I can query mu of t and find the distance and the velocity, okay? And that is basically how the Kalman filter works.